Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's um, ARF Brown Bag Talk. I would like to start by with our land acknowledgement. The archaeological research facility is located in Puchin, the ancestral and unceded territory of Chichenyo speaking Ohlone people, successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We acknowledge that this land remains of great importance to the Ohlone people and that the ARF community inherits a history of archaeological scholarship that has disturbed Ohlone ancestors and erased living Ohlone people from the, past, the present and future of this land. It is therefore our collective responsibility to critically transform our archaeological inheritance in support of Ohlone sovereignty and to hold the University of California accountable to the needs of all American Indian and indigenous peoples. So thank you for coming today and I'd like to pass the mic over to Kim Shelton. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you for um, having me here today to introduce our speaker. Um, many of you already already know Jesse, but just to formally introduce him, Jesse Obert is a PhD candidate in the um, Ancient History of Mediterranean Archaeology program here at UC Berkeley. Um, Jesse has had a, really a, a vast experience working in all different kinds of, of archaeology uh, in different different parts of the world, but most recently, of course, in Greece, he's had a long history with the site of Moklos um, in Crete. And it was there, I think, that he really got a lot of practice um, and experience working with ancient metals. And, and I think has become a real, um, well, it's almost, it's, it's better than a side hustle. It's really something that he, <laughs> truly enjoys doing um, in addition to field work and of course is also an ancient historian so he really hits all of the marks um, in his methodologies in the questions that he asks and of course in his teaching of which he also has had a vast amount of experience and and uh, I personally have benefited from his uh, experience teaching and, and I'm very happy to say that uh, so Jesse's going to be talking to us today about his dissertation project and uh, going into some questions um, that he uh, and things worked the recent work that he's done um, in in the field and when he was recently in Greece in order to to um, work and, and move forward that project which is the violence and state formation on Crete in the age of hoplite warfare so uh, please help me welcome uh, Jesse Obert to speak to us today on violence in Crete. Uh, thank you very much, Kim. I'm going to share my screen and blow it up. And okay, cool. So yeah, I just want to start by saying thanks to the ARF and to everyone else uh, for their support. I was able to get uh, funding from uh, Berkeley and from uh, some outside institutions that really helped me go to Greece. Uh, I was supposed to be there in 2020, 21, but COVID, so I was there last fall, and uh, the uh, you know the museums were very accommodating uh, in dealing with COVID and everything else. Um, so, uh, thank you to everyone. <laughs> I no longer have the ability to move forward. Okay, so Crete is on a very large island. It's uh, one of the largest islands in the Mediterranean. It's on the, in the Eastern Mediterranean and it's on one of the major sea ways uh, through sort of east-west through uh, the Mediterranean. Uh, it's also, there's a major trade route between Greece and Libya uh, on the Western side of the island. Uh, you, you basically have to go by uh, Crete if you're gonna go uh, from the Near East to Western Europe. So it was really a focal point for a lot of ideas and technology and trade and things like that uh, between the various regions. <laughs> so hoplites are is a, a complex term. Uh, it means a, it just means warrior. It used to have a much more specific meaning in, in that it was this, this type of uh, uh, enclosed faced helmet warrior with a with a horse hair crest and a bronze breastplate and a very large shield with a spear. Uh, that has been challenged more recently, and we are now sort of thinking about hoplites as uh, something similar to that, but all encompassing all warriors of, of the Greek period uh, of the Greek um, mainland and area. Uh, the age of hoplite warfare is a term that 
uh, as a chronological period that starts with the introduction, introduction of this equipment and then sort of ends in the late fifth and beginning of the fourth century with the uh, adaptations to it and the development of what will become Hellenistic war warfare. Crete has the earliest evidence for this equipment. It has the earliest enclosed faced helmets and the earliest uh, bronze, um, well, not the early, very earliest early bronze corslet, but a whole lot of uh, really early bronze corslets uh, and probably one of the earliest shields. So it's always been thought of as a sort of the beginnings of the hoplite, age of hoplite warfare. Uh, it also potentially has the uh, earliest city-states, uh, Greek city-state culture developing uh, before everywhere else in the Greek, in the Greek world. Uh, and so my dissertation is really trying to explore how these two phenomena are happening and, and how they're interacting with each other, the development of hoplite warfare and the development of the Greek city-state culture. So these 10 uh, blue stars are the 10 city-states uh, poles that have evidence for violence, organized violence in this period. Uh, and the red stars are extra urban sanctuaries. So these are kind of hard to reach sanctuaries that uh, would have been sort of limited to elites in uh, their accessibility. And so there were spaces for elites to interact with each other outside of the sort of uh, view of the rest of their communities. Uh, and they could sort of shed their political identities in order to just talk to each other and communicate with each other as elites. Um, and they were sort of restrictive spaces, not, not explicitly, but just due to the fact that it took a lot of time and money to get there for those festivals. Uh, Palais Castro uh, is a is a bit of a wild card. Uh, still, lots of debate about what act, how it's actually functioning. It's uh, potentially a, a third one, some sort of ancient Bronze Age uh, site that has been treating being treated like an extra urban sanctuary. But it is sort of an extra urban sanctuary. Um, so, if I were to ask this question, violence of state formation on Crete, twenty years ago, I would have uh, an ancient historian would have given me a, a single response. You know, just go look at Plato's Laws. Uh, in Plato's Laws, there's three characters debating uh, the sort of uh, the, the nature of laws and how to make the best community in ancient Greece. This is a fourth century text. Uh, there's a Cretan, a Spartan, and an Athenian. And at the beginning of the, the debate, the Cretan says, I suppose, stranger, that our customs are also easy for everyone to understand, for it is possible to see that the whole of the Cretan countryside is not a plain like that of the Thessalians, whereas they would rather use horses we run, since the land is uneven and more suitable for the practice of running by foot. It is necessary to possess light arms and armor in such a land and to not run with the burden. So the lightness of bows and arrows is considered to be a good fit. Therefore, everything for us is oriented around war. And it seems to me that our lawgiver arranged everything with this in mind. Uh, the consensus, the scholarly consensus for most of the 19th to 20th century was that this was a statement of uh, historical fact and that Plato had some good knowledge of Crete uh, and maybe he visited Crete and chose Crete as the location for this debate because it was a sort of fitting backdrop of, of how a good state should be. That idea has been challenged recently and uh, the structure of play, how, what Plato is doing, doing is being sort of reevaluated. Josiah Ober in his uh, 2019 Seda lectures came to Berkeley and talked about uh, folk theory uh, that, that Plato presents early on in his dialogues. And then he sort of tears it apart. He presents the stereotypes that everyone sort of assumes, and then he tears it apart over the course of this dialogue. And uh, I think that is exactly what's going on here. After the Cretan makes this statement, the Athenian spends the rest of book one picking it apart and showing, oh no, you're wrong. That's not actually how Crete is. Uh, the you know, Cretans run up hillsides and use light, light bows and arrows because the community is trying to encourage the rich people to do things like get good at bows and arrows and do uh, physical labor, like run up a hillside. It has nothing to do with warfare or anything else like that. Um, so I think we were like reassessing what this means and, and we were opening up a new area for uh, exploration if we sort of accept that there's some problems with Plato's summary of Crete. Uh, if you asked a military historian violence and state formation on Crete, and you'd probably get something like this. Uh, the movie 300 actually had several prominent uh, Greek military historians as advisors. So this is the sort of orthodox style of, of uh, hoplite warfare. Everyone was sort of standing, facing the enemy with the shield protecting the guy to their left and uh, you know, really heavy equipment, really heavily encumbered. And they all worked together in unison as a, as a troop and they were highly disciplined. Um, this idea uh, is, existed in the 19th century and then sort of uh, permeates through everything and is still very, very, a part of uh, Greek scholarship or scholarship of warfare uh, in a in a 
no, not recent anymore now, almost 10 years old, but in this book, Men of Bronze, uh, they, the editors sort of set out to end the debate once and for all. Uh, and in the inter their introduction, they uh, show how they wanted to uh, see how the orthodoxy holds up in light of recent, uh, recent criticism and to challenge revisionists to present a coherent paradigm that would do nothing short of rewrite the history of the early Greek polis, of the early Greek city-state. Uh, this approach, this sort of assumption that the orthodoxy must be right, uh, is really totally uh, uh, unfounded. There's no real good evidence for it. Uh, the current narrative of uh, uh, the hoplite orthodoxy was promoted by Victor Davis Hansen in his 1989, The Western Way of War. And he uses sort of uh, speculation about how the helmets must have felt and how heavy the equipment must have been. Uh, and then a whole lot of other outside comparative stuff to sort of make an argument that the hoplite warfare was this uh, manly, uh, cooperative, egalitarian thing that had huge ramifications for how Greek culture operated. And he has a very clear agenda. His, you know, if you look at his history, his bibliography, you see what he does with his with his uh, work. Uh, and I don't think a lot of scholars are taking that into full consideration when they start quoting his ideas. His most recent book called The Dying Citizen uh, argues that uh, uh, allowing immigrants into America and giving them citizenship is diluting the American citizen body and that that's going to cause the collapse of the uh, American experiment. Uh, you know, these are very neoconservative, like right wing ideas that are all grounded in his understanding of the hoplite orthodoxy, uh, that which again has no evidence for it. Uh, there has been some pushback over the years. Um, it just doesn't get very much attention. Hans van Mace's uh, Greek warfare myths and realities uh, showed how there's no evidence for the hoplite orthodoxy in the uh, classical literature. Uh, more recently, Roel Kanayadike's classical Greek tactics has uh, tried to reassess and present a new idea about how Greek for warfare must have operated in the classical period. Uh, and archaeologists like Anthony Snodgrass have been showing for years that there's just no uh, good reason to think that there's some sort of uh, system of, of, uh, of, of cooperation happening on the battlefield. Uh, so these, these, this push uh, for new paradigms, or this assumption that we need one single paradigm for the whole of Greek warfare, uh, I think is, is a totally uh, misguided approach. And uh, I think instead what we need to be thinking about is small scale regional practices when it comes to violence and, and, and the use of organized violence. And so something like Crete with its ex-urban sanctuaries, it's where these spaces where there's interaction happening between various uh, elites from different communities uh, is, a, is a sort of test case to sort of we, that we can build off of and sort of thinking about how Greek warfare or Cretan warfare and everything else is operating around each other. Um, so I think that this is, um, my dissertation is filling a gap. Uh, the goal is to study all of the evidence for organized violence on Crete through digital humanities. And I have uh, at this point 880 entries, uh, pieces of evidence for violence. So it's quite a large database uh, comparatively. Uh, and then I'm going to map it alongside the sort of political and economic and institutional changes that we already kind of know about for the archaic and classical periods. Uh, I have uh, two parts to my, to my dissertation. The first part creates the database and sort of uh, explains the justifications for putting all the artistic and epigraphic and archaeological evidence in a single space and how I compare them and everything else. And part two is a sort of temporary, this is what we know now, because I imagine as we do more archaeology on the island, the picture will change and we'll learn more and more over time. So uh, uh, I have an idea for what is there now, uh, and I have several important observations, but, uh, but I am very aware that this is going to change over time as we learn more. Uh, so those observations at this point, I have three observations. The first is that this often quoted line, internecine conflict and interpolity warfare, actually has no good evidence. Uh, it's, I think it, it's probably true. I think they probably were fighting each other a whole lot, and there was a lot of war on Crete, uh, but there's just no evidence for it. And the lack of evidence is notable uh, and worth pointing out. So something we need to be a lot more careful with when we're talking about warfare on Crete, Cretan warfare in general. Uh, the second observation is that the Archer narrative that, you know, this line from Plato that we've been uh, citing over and over again has really created a mirage in our evidence. And I think archaeologists have been looking for archery, and so they found it. Uh, and if we start picking apart the evidence that we do have, 
uh, it becomes a little questionable whether their archery is uh, really part of what we would call Cretan warfare, or if it's just another type of violence that's really important on the island uh, for the Cretans. Uh, and the third observation, which is the sort of bulk of what I'm going to be talking about today, is uh, that rather than real a real type of warfare that's unique to Crete, I think I've discovered uh, an elite masculine ideology. And what I mean by that is I think uh, violence, organized violence, is operating in a very interesting way within their within Cretan communities, uh, in which elites are using it as a way to express their eliteness and express their masculinity and keep their eliteness and masculinity. Uh, or, or um, maintain sort of barriers between certain members of the community and themselves so that they can be elite and masculine and everyone else is not, doesn't fit the bill. Uh, so it's it's part of this uh, state formation, state organization uh, process, I think, rather than a real on the ground practice, at least until uh, the end of my period in which we can actually get better evidence. Uh, so this is what my database looks like. Uh, this is just taken a screenshot. Uh, <laughs> The left-hand side is the sort of metadata. I have bibliographic information, description, uh, chronological information, material measurements, uh, contexts, and then links for uh, online uh, resources if you want to go look at the piece in the museum or something like that, or just see a good Google image of it. The, I have images and drawings for the ones that uh, are relevant uh, or that have that information, and then I have uh, the tags and the tags are really the bread and butter of what I'm doing. This is the, the backbone of of the approach. Excuse me. So each tag uh, is a argument that someone has made about about uh, violence or Greek warfare uh, and the way that uh, organized violence is is uh, uh, practiced in the ancient world. So uh, the first two working class hoplites versus leisure class hoplites. Uh, these are this is uh, Hans and Bases argument. Uh, for Athens and Sparta in the classical period, he argues that roughly half of uh, the Athenian and Spartan armies were working class hoplites and the other half were leisure class, meaning that half were guys who just sort of were, were conscripted and had to go show up and they fought the minimum uh, and practiced the minimum amount of time, you know, effort, put in the minimal amount of effort and bought the minimal amount of equipment in order to show up and do their duty and fight on the on the battle in the battle. Uh, whereas the other half were leisure class hoplites, guys who had enough money to sort of sit back and do whatever they wanted and actually put time and energy into trying to look good and trying to be good on the battlefield. Uh, and uh, just as a preview, there's really no evidence for working class hoplites on Crete at all, which is very interesting. <clears throat> but so I, the way that I do this is I, I take this Mitra, for example, uh, and I say, well, is this evidence for uh, ben Weiss's working class hoplites, yes or no? Is this evidence for leisure class hoplites, yes or no? And so this is a groin guard. This would have hung from the bottom, like from the belt over the groin. Uh, it's very highly decorated. It's very, it's very beautiful piece. And so it does satisfy uh, Ben Weiss's leisure class hoplites argument. And so I have a confidence coefficient associated with that. How confident am I that this does satisfy his argument? And it's out of three. And this metro, which is, uh, you know, even an accessory, if it was undecorated, it's even even more uh, sort of unnecessary to the kit uh, and beyond the minimal requirements by every measure. So it certainly is, to me, a, a, a good piece of evidence for Fenway's arguments for related class hoplites. Uh, so then I can go through the list, and I think most of these are self-explanatory. Uh, cavalry, siloi, which means uh, like light infantry for in Greek, attendants, mercenaries, mounted hoplites are guys who just ride to the battle and dismount to fight as hoplites. This is a uh, Greenhall's argument, Epilectoi is from uh, Kaniadike's uh, reconstruction of Greek warfare in the late fifth and early fourth centuries. There's sort of like special forces that are given um, uh, specific tasks on the battlefield. Um, archers and then the orthodox hoplite argument from Victor Davis Hanson. And then I've also included mobility restrictions and audio restrictions, so how obstructed are their hearing? How obstructed is their vision, visual restriction? These are all parts of uh, Victor Davis Hansen's argument. Uh, and then things like repair and, and use, uh, two different shield types, which are uh, Snodgrass's shield types, the large round shield versus the small omphalos type. Uh, and then these, the last three are single combat, group combat, or typology uh, segregation. So are they separating out typologies on the battlefield? And uh, I have no nothing to say about any of those because the evidence is just not very uh, clear. But I, you know, <laughs> included them anyway. So uh, this is a visualization of what my database looks like. So this is using FE uh, network analysis map, uh, and so every single dot is an entry in my database, and they're all connected together due to 
the various uh, uh, tags that they hit. But for now, before I get into exactly how to read this, I want to draw your attention to the types on the right. I have about 20% of vote or about voted miniatures. I have spearheads, arrowheads, you know, the rest, of, you know, arms and armor and plaques and inscriptions and coins and texts and painted pottery, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but what I think is uh, really interesting, and this is my first major observation, is mostly what we're missing from this list. Uh, we have we have no skeletal evidence for violence. We have uh, several. We have lots of skeletons in this period, but none of them have perimortem wounding, uh, which is worth emphasizing and noting. And how strange that is. Uh, we don't have any good evidence for use on all these on a uh, use in the sense of uh, use that would in, indicate. Uh, uh, large-scale warfare. We don't have any evidence of that on any of the arms and armor. Uh, we have evidence of damaging on a lot of pieces, but it's always only just a, like a single stab wound, which uh, is not uh, diagnostic for large-scale combat. Uh, we have basically no fortifications or fortresses before 400, which is something that has always perplexed Cretan archaeologists. Uh, Crete uh, in the periods before and after do have fortresses and fortifications, and in other parts of the Greek world they had fortresses and fortifications in these times. So that's sort of a strange anomaly that they don't bother uh, at all in this period. Uh, we have tons, we have hundreds and hundreds of inscriptions, um, and they the ones that are in this database, uh, about 3.35%, uh, are mostly referencing war booty. Uh, we don't have uh, explicit mentions of militaries, of warriors, of military alliances, military campaigns, casualties of war, or war captives. Um, and finally, the texts themselves, the uh, Athenian sources, uh, mostly Athenian sources, don't mention uh, interstate warfare by any measure on Crete before 400. Uh, Pindar and Herodotus might be referencing um, uh, civil conflicts, um, civil wars. Uh, and Thucydides might be describing a raid in 429, but I think that that is probably the first potential evidence for real interstate conflict. And it's a weird one uh, at that, it's a raid. Um, so to say that we have internecine conflict and interpolity warfare, I think uh, needs to be challenged. We need to sort of stop and wait and think, well, do we actually have any evidence for that? Um, as I said, I think it was happening, but we just don't have any evidence. So we need to be a lot more careful with how we're throwing those terms around as, uh, as scholars. This is how to read my network analysis. This is an introduction to network analysis. Uh, as I said, each dot is a entry in my database. So I have these four dots here, an arrowhead, a spearhead, uh, the, the lion hunt shield in the upper right, and then a mitra. And uh, whenever two or more dots hit uh, one of the tags, so this arrowhead and this shield are both hitting archery, they, a line is drawn between them. Uh, the arrowhead and the mitra are uh, do not have evidence for leisure class hoplites, but the mitra, the mitra and the uh, uh, shield are both evidence for leisure class, so they're tied together. Um, nothing is tied to working class hoplites, so that tag is just not going to be used at all. Uh, and then the spearhead, uh, which is doesn't hit any of my major tags, is just going to float away because it, it's not tied to anything else. Uh, so when I spin it around, it'll look something like this. And it's important to emphasize that sort of spatial relationship is not relevant to these sorts of graphs. Uh, they just happen to make that form uh, and you can turn it any which way and it doesn't change what you're looking at. Uh, the relationship is between how they're tied together uh, rather than where they are physically. But uh, clusters will form that are important and how those are, how those are tied. Here it is again, my network analysis map of my database. And I've gone ahead I do identify all the major clusters. The uh, top one and the one on the right, the two shield types are uh, self-explanatory. It's just different shield types that changed over time. The biggest bubble is this leisure class hoplites bubble, which I, which you can break down into how restricted they are in terms of their mobility and their ability to he see and hear. Uh, I have evidence for cavalry, but it's sort of um, disconnected and really concentrated in, in its different types. Uh, entry types, and I have archery, but it's mostly arrowheads. It's just, it's uh, uh, really dominated by arrowheads. Um, and I noticed that there's this sort of um, uh, <laughs> conduit through which leisure class hoplites and archery are connected, uh, which is mostly texts, which are the green nodes. Uh, and so I removed texts to see what would happen. And you get this uh, when you remove the texts. Texts are also the most, uh, they have the most tags of anything in my database. Uh, due to the nature of what they are. So uh, I was, it was also wanted to remove them just to see what would happen for that, in that, uh, for that reason. 
Uh, and when you remove them, you have just these two nodes sort of holding the class complex to our tree. And this is a, the lion hunt shield and a tripod stand both from Ida uh, in the perhaps early seventh, late eighth or, or seventh century. Um, they're uh, beautiful pieces of art and they're really great uh, objects to look and study, look at and study. Uh, but what's interesting is that the archery in this uh, in this instance uh, is not against other people. Uh, the lion hunt shields, which I'll talk a little bit more later, is is sort of um, uh, uh, archers are are saving other people by firing at these animals, these lions that are attacking people. And in the tripod stand, the archer is associated with this sort of like sphinx-like character uh, down here in the lower right. Um, so I wanted to investigate archery more specifically. And what I found is that uh, basically most of our evidence is probably related to hunting rather than organized violence, rather than what we might call warfare. Uh, these bronze appliques from Katosime, they're very clearly about hunting animals. There's a lot of animals in the images. Uh, the coins are typically, the arrowheads are typically associated with animals that would have been hunted, uh, like this uh, wild goat. Uh, and the arrowheads are mostly of this type 1D uh, in the lower left, uh, which Snodgrass is type 1D, which uh, he doesn't, uh, it's, it's impossible to know uh, a hunting arrowhead versus an interpersonal arrowhead due to the fact that uh, it's really the shaft of the arrow that determines its purpose. Uh, but you really want as much cutting edge as possible for a hunting arrow. Uh, and these ones have the most, these type 1Ds have the most cutting edge of any arrowhead in the archaic and classical periods. So uh, there is good reason, I guess, to think that this might be a hunting arrowhead. Uh, but just because it's a hunting arrowhead doesn't mean it wasn't used in combat. It just means that it would have been more expensive to produce. Uh, so take it or leave it. But uh, I wanted to see what would happen if you removed, uh, so here's my database again, and I wanted to see what would happen if you removed uh, this sort of uh, 1D arrowheads, which are pro which could be for hunting, and the bronze appliques and the coins that are very clearly about hunting. And you get this. Uh, everything reorients around leisure class hoplite. Uh, the texts are now subsumed by leisure class hoplite, hoplites and part of the bubble. The uh, lion hunt shield is now firmly in the middle. Uh, and the tripod stand has completely reoriented around the cluster and, and ended up between the shield types. Uh, you still have archery, of course, but it's uh, very prefer peripheral and periphery, I guess I should say. Uh, so this is my second observation that I think we've been looking for archery and we've been finding archery, uh, but we're not being careful enough to distinguish between hunting and archery. Um, Joshua Browers in his dissertation uh, argues that the word toxites means something else besides archer in the Athenian sources. He argues that it means somebody who has enough free time to get really good at shooting a bow and arrow because he argues that shooting an animal going hunting with a bow and arrow was sort of aristocratic, whereas a spear was more, was more uh, lower class or working class. Uh, and so I think we need to sort of think about what that word might be meaning for all of our sources and what archer really means and sort of reassess uh, this idea that, the, uh, that archery was specifically shooting bows and arrows. Again, I think they are shooting bows and arrows on Crete, and we do have good evidence of that. Uh, just as I think they are committing violence, um, but or in, in an organized way as warfare, but we just don't have the really solid evidence uh, to make that argument. And there's something off with how we're how we're approaching it, and we need to be a lot more careful with that. Um, so this also leads to my third observation, which is going to be the rest of my rest of my presentation uh, in the last 20 minutes. <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, the leisure class well, as you might have noticed this whole time, is really the main cluster uh, that we're talking about when we're talking about Cretan warfare. Uh, and so I think what we have here is an elite masculine ideology uh, related to being a leisure class hoplite uh, and being an elite and being a, um, and trying to express your masculinity. And we need to be thinking about uh, Cretan warfare and the evidence for Cretan warfare in, their, in those terms, in ideological terms. Uh, so here is the evidence over time. Uh, you'll notice this big dip in the late seventh century. This is a common problem that everyone knows about for Cretan archeology. span It's called the archaic gap. Uh, uh, basically the pottery chronologies are, are off <laughs> and uh, everyone knows it's there. And there's been a lot of work uh, in the last 10, year, 10 years or so to try and resolve this problem. And we're working towards a solution, but the evidence for organized violence has not been uh, addressed in any meaningful way. 
Oh, in my database, I have what looks like three chronological phases. Uh, the first phase ending in the mid to late seventh century, the second phase going from the mid to late seventh to the late sixth, and then the third phase going from the late sixth beyond till the end of my period. Uh, so it looks like we have three distinct chronological phases. And I should say the first break, uh, the late mid to late seventh century, it's a really important moment for Crete. Uh, at Azoria, you have the bulldozing of a bunch of uh, houses on the uh, in the center of town, and then they build these large civic and public buildings. Uh, at Dreros, you have the publication, uh, the inscription and publication of the earliest laws. Uh, and at Knossos, you have the complete uh, abandonment of, of several prominent cemeteries. So there's like major changes going on in the late seventh century, absolutely. And I, and I think it ties very well with this sort of ideological shift that's going on in the way that they're thinking about uh, organized violence. Uh, and then in the late 6th century, you have the emergence of this war booty regulation genre of treaties. Uh, we don't have very many of them, but uh, uh, prominent scholars uh, in uh, the study of Greek epigraphy and Cretan epigraphy have argued that it's the beginning of a much sort of uh, broader and larger genre that then continues into the Hellenistic period. And I think that this represents a shift in the way that the community and the elites are thinking about uh, violence as well. But as I said, this chronological uh, narrative doesn't work because <laughs> we know that the chronologies are off. Uh, and a good example of that is what happened at Azoria uh, most recently. So Azoria is uh, perhaps one of the best excavated and most recently excavated sites on Crete for the uh, for this period, for the archaic and classical periods. Uh, and they found a bronze helmet in a uh, like urban sanctuary in the middle of town, you know, hits all of my, you know, like all of my expectations. It's exactly what we want. It's super great. And it's the wrong typology. So it was found in early fifth century context, but it's a uh, late eighth, uh, early seventh century typology, this like barely tall crested open faced helmet. Uh, in other words, it's a it's a phase one helmet in a phase three context. So something is clearly wrong. Um, I think a better way to think about this is is in the sort of like continuum sort of uh, and based on context more than anything else. In fact, I forgot there was a, there's an extra slide that I forgot to show you, but but uh, I'll summarize it. Uh, so uh, the first phase, which I'm calling the ideology of camaraderie, is really concentrated in extra urban spaces uh, and in spaces that are sort of restricted to elites. And a lot of the mortuary contexts at Knossos are probably uh, elite restricted. At least that's the argument. Uh, and this probably starts in the late ninth or early eighth century. So outside, just before my period begins. Uh, this this ideology, uh, and I'll get into exactly what I think is happening with it. But it it seems to continue as far as we can tell uh, till the end of my period. Uh, but with the late seventh century transitions, uh, all of the mortuary contexts and extra urban con uh, extra urban sanctuary contexts uh, disappear, and we now have an overwhelming, uh, huge uptick in urban sanctuary uh, er evidence from urban sanctuaries. And in these contexts, we have a very different ideology, we, what I'm calling the ar army of one mentality, which is my phase two. And so I think through the late, in the seventh and sixth centuries, there's actually like a dueling ideology happening just in different contexts and ex-urban sanctuaries uh, have this more uh, cooperative style of, of or approach to uh, organized violence and urban spaces have this more individualistic uh, uh, approach. Uh, the third phase uh, begins, uh, following some major changes in the way that the city, the city states are trying to deal with organized violence, in particular, the war booty regulations. And so I think it's, a, again, happening at the same time, just like slightly different perspective and different uh, space for this, this sort of uh, uh, type of ideology. In particular, I should emphasize that, that whereas phase one and two are ways in which elites are expressing their eliteness and masculinity and talking about violence, and thinking about violence, and it may not actually be practical, uh, real warfare, organized violence happening on the ground. The third phase, which is uh, mostly Athenian sources looking at Crete, uh, might be good evidence for actual violence uh, happening on the ground, but it's all violence that's happening outside of Crete. So uh, it still doesn't necessarily show that there's internecine warfare on the island. It just shows that uh, how Cretan warriors were actually fighting. So whereas phases one and two are ideologies in the purest sense that we have no evidence that they're actually being sort of uh, 
practiced on the ground and it might look very different on the ground. Phase three is, a, is an on the ground ideology that's being practiced in, in reality. Uh, okay, so now I'm gonna go through each of the phases and describe them a little in more detail. Uh, phase one, which is concentrated in extra urban sanctuaries and in uh, elite spaces, uh, has the omphalos shield type, has an open-faced helmet. It's very much dominated by leisure class hoplites. We also have this big archery uh, cluster. Uh, and the evidence uh, looks a lot like this. We have these sort of cooperative uh, images, you know, hoplites, and it's kind of hard to see, but hoplites all running together towards a common, common uh, enemy, uh, marching off together, uh, guys standing shoulder to shoulder, fighting shoulder to shoulder, uh, more cooperative styles of warfare like naval warfare. And this is the only time uh, we get any references to naval warfare despite Crete being an island. Uh, and then we have these um, uh, sort of more open-faced helmets, these uh, lighter shields, these more fluid styles of combat. And this is what I think a phase one warrior might have looked like with their all crested helmet and open-faced helmet. Uh, they use spears and swords, but in general, I can't really say much about weapons because the uh, weapons are all <laughs> earlier and they probably continue on uh, without much change, but the archaeology is really hard to pinpoint. Uh, but the shields are all these beautiful, decorate, beautifully decorated, um, tend to be lighter, tend to be more uh, one-handed style, so more maneuverability. Uh, uh, and everything seems to be a lot more cooperative and organized. So they can see and hear each other very easily. And I think the Lion Hunt Shield um, is the best example of this, uh, best way to think about what this ideology is doing. Uh, in this image, all the all the sort of hand-to-hand -hand warriors, uh, warriors with swords are, are in dire, are being attacked by lions and are in a bad way. Uh, and the archers are coming in to save the day. Um, and uh, you can see how the enemies are are natural or maybe mythological in some cases, but there's never sort of these images of actual people killing people. And instead, it's just like sort of we're all in this together idea. I'm sorry, there's someone blowing in, out, <laughs> out on the street. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, so there's a uh, this this sort of like us versus them mentality. This sort of like we're in this together. I think this is really important to how Cretan elites are expressing this ideology of camaraderie in this one. These two looks very differently. Um, and uh, there's a leisure class hoplites bubble. There's a large round shields bubble. There's closed face helmets and cavalry. There's archery, and um, so this is. Uh, uh, there was a technical difficulty right before I brought this up, but uh, this is not. This is a mid sixth century. Uh, a plaque that probably does not belong here. And so, in fact, I think archery is just going to float away and does not actually, is not related to uh, phase two. Uh, it was still very much there, but again, it's probably just hunting arrows that are in urban spaces. Um, so here are some big graphs to show you. Uh, what's happening, I think, in the late seventh century is this shift and uh, things like cavalry, things like uh, mounted hoplites, which is a very wealthy style of warfare, and attendants are upticking in the late seventh century. Uh, and although leisure class hoplites is going down, here's the total, uh, and here's leisure class hoplites. Even though it's going down as a percentage, it's actually getting uh, a larger uh, percentage of the total. And so by the by the late seventh, early sixth is when you really start to see leisure class hoplites dominate uh, in this phase two. And I think this is a sort of monopolization of violence by the elites. I think that they're making violence, organized violence, a sort of elite only practice where you have to have a certain uh, amount of wealth in order to be, uh, in order to buy in to the process and in order to be able to claim that you're a warrior, you need to have the whole kit and a certain amount of wealth in order to support that. Uh, and here, this uh, the helmets shift as well in this period in pretty dramatic ways. And they start completely obstructing the hearing and peripheral vision. Uh, and I'm, I'm calling this the army of one mentality because I think uh, there's a lot of parallels to uh, the sort of army of one military slogan of the early 2000s in America. The idea was to sort of sell people on individualism and say that you get to be this uh, you know, army of one super individual uh, warrior, when in fact everyone knew that joining the US military, you had to sort of train to become a team member and work in, as a team. Uh, so there's this sort of uh, false narrative being uh, being uh, uh, promoted. Uh, and I think the same thing is happening in Crete. I think this type of warfare would have required a lot of attendance. Uh, this, this, in this plaque from Palais Castro, you get to see 
this warrior who's stepping up onto the chariot. So he's relying on a charioteer. He's got a guy behind him with an open-faced helmet so he can sort of watch his back. Uh, this style of warfare would have requir required teamwork and a lot of collaboration, but that's not how they're uh, talking about it. That's not how they're they're sort of displaying in art and everything else. And in, it's always about the individual uh, and the army of one mentality in this phase too. <clears throat> uh, I think masculinity is also changing in this time. So you have this uh, phase one warrior on the rib cage of this corslet uh, and uh, his shield, his omphalos type shield, is basically just replacing his torso and instead he's just a head with some legs on a on a shield. Uh, but now in phase two, uh, and you have uh, this new emphasis on the male anatomy and you have the uh, rib cage and these pecs, which are uh, very common features of male figurines on Crete in this period. And so it's a sort of emphasis and focus on what makes a man anatomically a man, uh, as well as these groin guards, which are uh, just all about <laughs> anatomy in many ways. Uh, and if you look at how phase one is dominated by shields, it, the phase two is just completely dominated by mitri, these groin guards. Uh, and there's just a complete shift in how they're, in how they're using these objects uh, and displaying these objects. And that doesn't mean that shields go away. I think, uh, I don't need to, everyone's here, it's probably an archeologist, don't really need to go into this too much, but, but the omphalos type shields, which is dominating phase one, uh, do leave behind evidence because they're mo they have bronze in them, especially the omphalos itself. We have tons of the, the, uh, the little uh, centers of the shield, the navels, uh, but the large round shield is almost all wood, so they don't really show up, and we don't have actually any real examples of uh, the large round shield uh, on Crete, only in art. But it doesn't go away; it doesn't it doesn't disappear. There's, they're still using shields in this period in phase two. It's just that they're no longer uh, detectable archaeologically. So here's the phase two warrior. Uh, I really like the steely from Prinias because it, I'm pretty sure we're we're getting an X-ray vision. This uh, is supposed to be his shield, and we're looking through it in order to look at his. Uh, manly booty and his manly uh, anatomical features that make him a man and his heavy chest armor and this like heavy equipment that he's uh, that he's wearing. Uh, he would have he's obviously worn wearing an enclosed face helmet that's obstructing his vision and hearing. He's wearing a corslet that, that would have uh, been a little stiff. He's wearing uh, a groin guard uh, and perhaps sometimes ankle guards of some sort. Uh, and then this large round shield now instead of the small and type. Uh, so um, when I was originally doing this, I was uh, sort of shocked that the phase two is so uh, individualism in promoting individualism and um, indi individual ideas uh, about about being a warrior as a sort of individual experience because it goes very much against. Initially, I thought it went very much against the sort of current narrative about this period. Uh, Gunnar Zelentag has argued that uh, Cretan elites were institutionalizing elite competition in this period. And they were promoting egalitarianism amongst the elites in order to sort of create barriers between the elites and everyone else and to sort of make eliteness be ex an exclusive group so you don't compete with each other so that you maintain a little a, a level of, of social uh, uh hierarchy and uh and status quo uh but now that i've been doing a little more thinking about it i think it actually if you think about uh, masculinity and what is doing masculinity and what you think about the monopolization of violence by the elites it actually works very well because because the claims of being an individual are within the sort of uh, pre-established uh, uh, declaration that violence has to be committed by wealthy elites. Uh, elites commit violence against other elites. So the buy-in cost to be a warrior is so high and so exclusive already that then they can have these claims about being an individual and these expressions of individuality because there's a, it's already uh, within an enclosed space or within a, um, uh, an excluded space. I mean, it's still public, but it's, and within a, it's only going to be elites on elites and uh, fighting against them amongst elites, which is very interesting. Oh, in the middle of the sixth century, we have this uh, new practice happening where they're inscribing their armor. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, the inscriptions all have a, a, a standard style. They have the name, uh, Tonde, which is um, like this object, and then Hele, which is a form, form of Ireo, uh, meaning to like take or to bear. And a lot of them have, are so they also use oppo in some sense. So I think these are probably pieces of war booty that are being taken from the battlefield and brought back to the community and then displayed in the sort of hearth, uh, hearth temples, these uh, urban sanctuary spaces. Um, and we don't have them just on Mitri, we have them on uh, corslets and helmets as well. Uh, and I think, and most of them are dated usually to the sixth century. 
And I think that this is sort of shifting. It's a mechanism by which elites are expressing their eliteness and their masculinity in this phase two period. And I think this sort of kickstarts uh, what, what's happening in phase three. So they're sort of, they're, they're sort of um, uh, conflating the, uh, the process by which they claim eliteness with the actual ideology of eliteness, which is very interesting. Uh, we move into phase three and you'll notice there's a lot less evidence and a lot more texts. Uh, the, uh, but the, the, what I think is cool is that the main central little node there is epilectoi, which so we're no longer orienting ourselves around leisure class hoplites, but we're still orienting around ourselves around a rather uh, specialty type of warfare. So uh, these war booty regulations that start happening in the late sixth century and then uh, more in the fifth century, uh, they are uh, evidence of communities, uh, city states uh, trying to institutionalize one aspect of organized violence. And they, they never tell the warriors where to fight or how to raise an army or who gets to fight, and who doesn't get to fight. They only regulate how that war booty is brought back into the community. And rather interestingly, in this, the Tylesos Kenosos Argos inscription in the mid fifth century, uh, all of the booty brought back is uh, sort of organized and managed and regulated by the, the city state, by the community. Uh, so the warriors get nothing, which is interesting. Uh, they get the prestige and the, you know, the claim of everything of, of dedicating it, but, but all of it ends up going to probably a, a extra urban sanctuary and an urban sanctuary. And the, and the city determines how that is being distributed. Sorry. Uh, and I think what's happening in this, these late sixth century is this big shift uh, tied to other major things happening on the island, like this spread of coinage and the adoption of coinage in the early fifth century. Uh, that's when a lot of Cretan or several Cretan states start using coinage. Uh, we have this sort of uh, practice at Gorson where they shifting from thinking about fees and um, physical objects to thinking about them in terms of, of uh, money, in terms of coins. And so I think this fits really well in the sort of commodification or monetization process that's happening on Crete. They're now thinking about war booty in terms of uh, uh, rather than sort of <laughs> amorphous uh, things that you're bringing back to within the community. They're sort of putting price tags on it in a way and sort of thinking about how it's operating and commodifying it in a way. Uh, and this triggers a new way of thinking about violence. So there's still these dueling ideologies happening between the ideology of camaraderie and egalitarianism amongst elites and the sort of individualism, uh, elites only, uh, highly individualistic uh, style of army one mentality, phase two warfare. But now in the phase three, they're, they're em the emphasis is not on the practice of violence, but is now on the accumulation of wealth through the violence. So it's about what you do with your violence rather than how you are a violent individual. Uh, and I think these plaques, um, there's three plaques from Eastern Crete. Uh, these, I think these plaques really uh, emphasize this point really well. So this is a phase two warrior. He's got his manly uh, anatomical features and his heavy equipment. Uh, but the sort of, I think the sort of focus of this image is not is on the warrior, but it's, it's, it's on the slave or individual that he's dragging along. It's about what he does with his military power now uh, and how he converts that into sort of economic power for the community. Uh, so I think this, this is a new way of thinking about how violence should be carried out on the island and how it's organ and, and how it operates within the community. So if we look at our texts, uh, this is the period where we actually have good evidence in our texts for Cretan warriors. Uh, the way that they're described is a little bit all over the place. So we get a lot of references to archers, but as I said, there might be some problems with that word and thinking about what that means. Uh, we have them described as leisure class hoplites. We have them described as siloi, as, as light infantry, as cavalry, as epilectoi, and as mercenaries. So I think like Cretans are sort of doing a little bit of everything. They just were where they need to be uh, when they're asked to be there. <laughs> and they're sort of just like a, you know, just professional warriors are doing, doing uh, whatever needs to get done. Uh, and uh, it's a little vague in, in terms of what exactly, uh, how they're fighting uh, and how uh, they're committing violence on the ground. But I think what's really interesting is that out of these seven uh, Athenian sources, uh, five of them specifically mention Cretans looting and pillaging, and even describe at times Cretans uh, going out of their way to go loot and pillage and breaking, you know, the expectations. You know, in, in the in the Hellenica, they're they're not where they're supposed to be because they decided to go loot Nafplio instead of uh, be where they're supposed to be. So this emphasis on in our sources on how they're obsessed with looting, I think, fits very well with this transition into thinking about organized violence on the island as a as a what you how you turn your military power into economic power and this focus on collecting war booty as a sort of way of expressing your eliteness and masculinity.
so here's my phase three warrior. Uh, I don't have any archaeological evidence for this period, so I'm I'm guessing from art. I think there's still a big focus on what makes a man like anatomically a man, so the male the male body. Uh, but again, this new focus on uh, collecting wealth and using your body and your manliness and your eliteness to produce uh, uh, wealth for the community. Uh, so here's the the overarching idea uh, in terms of the ideological shifts. You have these dueling ideologies of the ideology camaraderie and the army of one mentality happening in the seventh and sixth centuries, uh, really concentrated based on where uh, the spaces are that they're that these objects are appearing and these this art is appearing uh, with some uh, some differences uh, and some exceptions. Uh, and uh, these two ideas are sort of um, co uh, coalescing into the uh, phase three, which is this uh, uh, thinking about, uh, rather than thinking about how elites are expressing their eliteness and their masculinity, it's about focusing instead on uh, what they do with that eliteness and that masculinity. And I think in a lot of ways, it has to do with how the community is sort of taking over. In every instance of this, the Cretans are fighting in small groups uh, where they are uh, doing specific things on the battlefield. And they're like these really high uh, highly decorated um, and uh, very fully kitted out leisure class hoplites. Uh, and this is all happening before the advent of the Theban sacred band, which is according to Roel Kniedike and many other scholars. So the first instance of uh, the institutionalization of epilectoi. So the first time any mainland Greek community has a, like a solid state funded uh, group of men that are paid to fight uh, in small groups and take specific objectives. So in many ways, the Cretans in all these texts are sort of fighting as proto epilectoi And so this is perhaps an interesting way to think about how the ideologies on Crete that, uh, that are shifting and changing over time are building into this larger phenomenon that then would have much larger ramifications for the, the way that Greeks are, or, are committing violence and also how uh, Greek people in general are uh, Greek history, I guess, <laughs> in the way that these are, things are happening. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jesse. That was fascinating. Um, I want to invite people to, oh, Kim, you're still here. <laughs> if you want to moderate the questions, uh, feel free to jump in. Or it looks like we have lots of questions. Great. So, Oh, no, those were clapping hands. All right. Those were yeah. clapping hands. Yeah. Let's see if anybody has, uh, if anyone has a question for, for Jesse. Pipe, pipe on in or raise your hand one or the other. It'd be great. Paula. Hi, Jesse. <laughs> I sort of thought maybe I would I would um, alert you that I was going to pop in and then I, I didn't. <laughs> so hi. Yeah. Um, it's, been, it's been great to hear more about your project. I think I understand better now what you're doing. Um, that's pretty exciting. Um, I have lots of little questions mm -hmm. um, that I won't. I won't uh, raise now, but I have one sort of larger question, which has to do with your transition in the, um, the economic aspects of warfare and the control of the, of the armor. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with the fact that it's all found in sanctuaries, correct? You distinguish between regional and urban sanctuaries, fine. Um, we have the epigraphic evidence that suggests that at some point, um, we certainly do have the community intervening in the, mm -hmm. um, the distribution of the booty. Um, but I'm not sure that for the, the, your phase one, and maybe the, at least the early parts of your phase two, that you have the evidence to decide who's making those dedications, um, whether it is an individual and whether that dedication is one's own armor or whether it's captured armor, we can certainly say that with the inscribed um, so-called Afrati armor, but with the other, I don't think we can make the claim um, that this is all private and individual rather than in some way a collective action. So That's I want a very to good off. point. Yeah. Uh, I would uh, let's see. 
I would uh, agree with you, I think. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think uh, it doesn't, um, in the earliest parts, it could very well be the case. And I think that uh, the problem is we just don't know. So uh, we, it could be individual, it could be some sort of um, community dedication. I think it's really interesting that in the fifth century, uh, the evidence is, seems pretty clear that extra urban sanctuaries are done by the community as a whole. Uh, uh, and there's no evidence for urban sanctuary dedications, but uh, it seems like, uh, especially when well, we have Gorton, uh, Tylesos, Knossos, and uh, Axos, they all seem to be focusing on extra urban sanctuaries as places where the city gets to determine what's, what's uh, dedicated to those. Uh, and we also have the fact that all of the extra urban sanctuaries and their archeological evidence uh, in the late seventh century, which is probably part of the dating problem uh, for Crete. So um, we really have no idea for the earlier periods, unfortunately. I don't know if it necessarily changes the fact that those ideologies exist, which is more of what I'm trying to uh, promote, that there are different ideologies in different spaces, which I think uh, whether or not the community is doing it or the elites are doing it, you know, how much of the community is being controlled by the Andreon, this elite club of, of, of uh, men. Uh, I don't necessarily have an answer to that question yet. <laughs> so I'm, I'm leaving it open uh, because uh, I'm only trying, I can only say only so much at this point with the evidence that we have. And sure. saying that it exists, I think is all I can really say, that there is this distinction. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions for Jesse? Is that is Sarah? Yes, please. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about um, the so the this elite masculine ideology associated possibly with um, hunting. Uh, do you have you or are there zoo archaeological assemblages that you could draw on for? the evidence for things like boar and uh, deer and the kinds of things that might be um, part of that kind of hunting of, of yeah. scary things by elites well this is one of the this is why uh this is why part two is uh temporary because uh there there does exist these large collections but no one has studied them yet so uh there is a lot of uh evidence from some of the older excavated sites and they're just sitting in boxes uh you know no one has touched them yet so once we get to do a little bit more uh, archaeology uh, on the Iron Age, uh, Crete, Cretan archaeology is dominated by Bronze Age people. So once more Iron Age archaeology is done, we can actually probably say more about uh, how hunting is operating and working. Uh, yeah, Thanks. but <laughs> one day. <laughs> it's a good. It's a good approach to the methodology, though. I'll say, just a specter from the Bronze Age, that. <laughs> You, you know, you not only can you turn up um, some unexpected faunal material in different um, in in domestic contexts that you wouldn't expect. It clearly had to have been a result of hunting, but that we also potentially, if if some isotope analysis is done on that, you can also tell if we have some evidence from earlier, of course, on the mainland that some wild species are actually being controlled and raised so that they'll be easier to hunt than they would be otherwise otherwise we find that in some of our deer so that i would be that would seems to me like a place with what you're describing that it could that could be a possibility in that period too it would be very interesting yeah that'd be super cool i the the one of the problems with cretan archaeology is that there is a lot of difference between all the cities so Azoria has been really well excavated, and there has been a lot of work done on on their uh, on their bones, on their animal bones. Uh, but there's no arrowheads, so right. as opposed to Afradi, which is covered in arrowheads, uh, and no one has studied any of the bones. So, uh, yeah, there's just differences between them. So one day we'll be able to figure out more, and I think there's going to be a difference between various parts of Crete. But at this point, mm -hmm. the evidence is just so sparse that we need to sort of talk about Crete as a uh, this is these are the sorts of ideas that are floating around and you know that sort of thing that sort of way a little more nebulous at this point. <laughs> Great. Any other questions for Jesse today? Emily. 
Yeah, thank you, Jesse. Um, it's a really wonderful um, presentation. Very, very um, dynamic with all of your all of your graphs. Again, it's a really great way to see um, how your evidence is shaking out. Um, inevitably, my question is a historian's question. Um, I I find it um, a bit of a stretch of the imagination to suppose that. Um, there was no warfare of the kind that one normally associates with that word. In other words, armed conflicts between communities uh, in, let's say, your phase two. Um, and I, you know, while I, I while I applaud the the care with which you're trying to to highlight the evidence that we actually have, I want to ask you if you could comment on how the evidence that you're seeing for that period, I'm, I'm thinking especially of your phase two army of one mentality, right? Is there a way to square the evidence that we do have with a plausible but not demonstrated reality that communities were fighting one another? I mean, I can just take mainland Greece as an example in the same period, we have lots and lots of interpolity, armed conflict, especially over resources, boundaries, sanctuaries, that kind of thing. So can you just sort of walk us through how you would think about potentially reconciling the evidence that you have now with, with that scenario in which there actually was armed conflict between communities? Um, I think, so I think we need to find the spaces in which this evidence is going to be appearing because uh, the cemeteries that we have are very elite cemeteries for this period. Uh, and uh, so I, I always think about uh, Sparta uh, and, the, and the Persian Wars and how their army was composed of about 80% slaves. So I'm looking at what elites are doing and how they're talking about violence. And I think it's very possible that there's like one or two of these guys and then hundreds of slaves in their armies at this period. And we really know nothing about, we know we know some things about slavery on Crete in this period, but, but a lot of it is speculation. And we're still having a really hard time pinpointing and figuring that out. And I think what Grace Ernie is doing in her uh, survey data uh, is reassessing what these what we do have and what we're looking at. I think that might be a way to start thinking about where the slaves are and how these communities are really being organized, how much of the hierarchy is there. Uh, and if it's anything like Sparta, which everyone likes to say that Crete is like Sparta, but uh, there is some good, good reason for that and there's some bad reasons that that's not true. I don't think that I don't I, I would I don't like the idea of them being Dorian. I like Cretans being Cretans. Uh, but uh, if there is something comparable to that and we can sort of see how uh, slave armies are a big part in the Peloponnese, a big part of the Peloponnese in the fifth century and late sixth century. So maybe we can sort of think about how the Cretan armies would have been composed and then look for that evidence in the spaces where those people are. We're looking right now for evidence of interstate uh, polity, interpolity violence in the spaces of elites. And it's pretty clear to me that that is not what we're finding. We're finding an ideology that elites have. If we really want to find interpolity warfare, we need to probably look at where the slaves are instead, which, as I said, I think what Grace is doing in survey data is, is probably the best bet for that. Uh, the, the sanctuaries themselves are, are, are for uh, the wealthiest, I think. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> it, it does. It doesn't totally satisfy my concern, no. though, because I'm, yeah. I mean, I'm thinking about, obviously, we can talk about this later, but maybe it's sort of interesting to those assembled to, to, to sort of have part of this conversation because it's methodological also, right? Um, if we were to take away from, say, the mainland Greek context, the kinds of evidence that you don't have for Crete, what how different would would the, the mainland Greek situation look from the Cretan situation based on what remains, right? The, the, yeah. style, the style of, um, of the arms and the armor that are dedicated at prominent sanctuaries might look a little bit different, but the stuff that survives in those contexts definitely looks elite. And yet we know from literary and epigraphic uh, evidence um, that, the, that many of these objects stem from, you know, uh, factual uh, interstate 
conflict. So it seems like there's there this is primarily a problem of evidence. Um, so, well, I think you're uh, you're touching on my next project. I think <laughs> <laughs> because because I think that it's absolutely true. If you take away if you look at the mainland and you look at what I've discovered in terms of Cretan uh, approaches to organized violence, there's going to be a lot of parallel. And so I. Think this is going to really dovetail with what Roel Kniedijk and a lot of the sort of modern uh, revisionist military historians have been talking about, and that we need to reassess what Cretan warfare really was in, in the ancient world. And so I think what I'm finding in this sort of like elite approaches to it as being this venue for ideological expression and eliteness and masculinity, more so than as a as a way of uh, conquering or or, or uh, things like that might actually fit very well with the evidence for the mainland and it might force us to sort of reassess what's going on there uh, there's a there's a scholar working in the near east who who has actually broken apart ways of committing organized violence into into various categories and there's conquest and there's raiding and there's sieging and there's naval operations and for for us in the greek world we just sort of assume that all warfare was about conquering we don't really think about the fact that if you're going to go on a raid to get a bunch of movable property, you're not gonna prepare for it in the same way that you would if you were gonna go conquer the land or, or even siege the land. And so there's a there's good reason to think that there's different types of organized violence, types of warfare happening on Crete. Uh, we've just been sort of uh, doing a one size fits all, especially you know post-Orthodox, everyone's just trying to get one Greek type of warfare to fit everything. So by looking at Crete in specifics, I think I eventually will be able to turn, once I have this evidence for this regional space, I'll be able to turn to the mainland and say, well, actually, we might need to reassess what's going on there too, because uh, we're sort of assuming that it's it's one size fits all. Uh, uh, yeah, I do think that they're definitely still fighting though. I think that there definitely are major armies, you know, clashing on Crete in these periods. It just, it's just, we need to be a lot more careful with how we're thinking about the, how that's working for the community uh, and the economies and the politics of the communities. Thanks, Jesse. Okay, anything, anything last minute? We've bit over time. So I guess we'll thank everybody for coming and thank you, Jesse, so much for um, presenting uh, your work to us. Fascinating. Still, I, I, again, the more we find, the more we'll know. So that'll be our mandate going forward. Thank you, Jesse. Thanks you everyone. Have a good day. Thank you.